Welcome to Zoo Tours, the channel that brings the zoo right to you. If this is your first time here, please hit those like and subscribe buttons along with that bell icon to officially join the zoo crew. Before the opening of the International Orangutan Center and with the addition of the Flights of Fancy Bird Exhibit and with their brand new Crocodilian Station, the Indianapolis Zoo was almost strictly a biome-centric park. In other words, each section focused on a different environment, no matter what continent the animals came from. So the zoo's opening year had forests, plains, deserts, and the oceans. Originally a Galleria of the world's fresh and salt waters, after just less than 20 years as Indiana's only aquarium, the inside was overhauled to create a more modern display of the world's coastal, tropical, and frigid oceans. According to the designers, the Oceans exhibit explores the visitors' perceptions, connections, and fears of the sea, while allowing guests to gain new insight to the myths and misconceptions of the underwater world. On yet another long and extensive tour, we'll see over 50 sea creatures you'd expect to see in an aquarium, some you definitely would not expect to see, and others that we'll rarely see again on this channel. Along with not just one, but two unique displays that would automatically make any zoo worth a visit. So, let's begin. The very first animals of this episode are, you'll have to wait and depending on what day you visit, you may actually have to wait to get in. But when you do, that Midwest environment is left behind and replaced with the smell and senses of seawater that creates this feeling of ascension into the ocean depths. The first impression of this darkly lit gallery is a long temperate environment with a school of look down fish, smooth dogfish sharks, which we'll get to later, and cow nose rays. We see them so much, but we never actually talk about them. Have you ever wondered how this species of eagle ray got its name? Well, ray comes from the fact that it's a ray. As for cow nose, if you look at the front of their face, you're not gonna find much. But if you were to look at them from above, as you usually do in touch tanks, the top of their heads is shaped like a cow snout from a bird's eye view. Even though just about every aquarium has them, Indy's coral reef is just as beautiful and vibrant as the rest. This represents the Red Sea and the Indo-Pacific. The latter is home to the richest reefs in the world in terms of biodiversity. Indianapolis's contains nearly 25 out of the thousands of reef fishes. On your next visit, try to find triggerfish, powder blue tangs, big nose unicorns, yellow banded angelfish, saddleback butterflies, bannerfish, and more that you can read below. Fit with bright stripes, flashy fins, and long spines, the lionfish is beautiful but deadly. Those venomous spines are not used to bring down prey, but they're for defense that can offer you a powerful and painful sting. And don't worry, you're very likely to survive, but that doesn't mean you won't have to deal with fever, shortness of breath, swelling, and possibly cardiac arrest. So in case you ever planned on petting one, which I don't know why you would, but it's best to admire the lionfish from afar. Speaking of petting, the second room is where you can get hands-on at the touch pool. Before a lot of you Zoo Tours veterans out there roll your eyes, this isn't just some stingray bay. It may look like one, and it may have cow nose and southern stingrays. The zoo wouldn't tell me its dimensions, but it is, or it opened as, the nation's largest interactive shark tank, with a shiver of more smooth dogfish or dusky smoothhounds, a bottom dwelling and migratory shark that's most abundant off the shores of Massachusetts down to Brazil, and separately in Argentina. You all know that sharks have this false reputation as mindless eating machines. That's especially not true for these guys. And no, it's not because they're too small to do any damage, but they don't have razor sharp teeth. They have eight to 10 rows of flat blunt teeth that's more so used to crush and grind food. So could they bite? As every zookeeper would answer, anything with a mouth can bite. So would you live? Yeah. To ease the crowd's skepticism, to go side by side with the Shark Wall of Fame, 
the other wall shows how the media has infamously painted them as monsters. And to add to that, divers report that the smooth hound isn't aggressive. They're shy and avoid people. And that's not an easy thing to do when you're in a touch tank. So if they feel they've had enough, the sharks can go to the rest area where they can stay out of our reach. The third section is a hallway specifically designed for the little guys. On the right are eight separate tanks for various anemones, sea cucumbers, sea stars, and clownfish, showing off their symbiotic relationship with the anemone. The anemone provides them shelter and protection, while the clownfish provides their living home with nutrients from their own waste. In the middle of the room sits three columnar tanks that go to the ceiling, so you can actually surround more clownfish, yellow tanks, coral hogfish, angelfish, urchins, and one of the aquarium's newer additions, the pot-bellied seahorses. At the very end of the hall is a smaller coral reef, except this time it's actually a living reef. I couldn't tell you the coral species, but I can tell you that they provide a home for pink skunk clownfish, bangai cardinalfish, more tangs, and green promises. Every aquarium has that one or a few spots that really connects you to the animals. In here, that's their gray seal and California sea lion habitat. One of our last stops on the tour, and at the same time, the very first thing you see going right through the zoo gates. Despite the name, these sea lions are not limited to just California but they range from the Pacific coast of central Mexico all the way up to the southeastern part of Alaska. And when they're not lounging on beaches and rocky coves, they're in the water in pursuit of their next meal. They'll even stay off the mainland for two weeks at a time. The Cali sea lion's eyes are very sensitive to changes in light and rapid movements, but the colors they see on the spectrum is very limited. Their color vision is dichromatic and they're only able to discriminate shades of blue and green, an adaptation for their aquatic lifestyle. Here in Indy, as you would expect most pennypeds to be, they're always on the move, gliding past the crowd. And maybe if they like you, they might even stop by the window and say hello. According to their website, this rocky shore is home to two gray seals and seven sea lions four that are named after cheese, and three that were rescued. And you can read about their personalities and their stories in the description. If you thought that and the shark pool attracted good-sized crowds, they don't even compare to what's over by the world's most famous ocean birds. The Southern Rockhopper, the Gentoo, and the Kings. Penguins that are found on the surrounding islands of the sub-Antarctic regions and the southernmost parts of South America, except for the Gentoo, which can actually be found naturally on the Antarctic Peninsula. They make a pretty common trio, but they'll never fail to make their exhibit one of the most popular areas in any zoo or aquarium. Here you can meet the birds on your left and your right. At first glance, the two environments look separated, but if you look down, you'll find that the halves are connected by a water passage that's on the floor, so they can swim right under your feet. It may not be the best or biggest of its kind, but how often can you say that you went to a zoo and were not only surrounded by penguins, but you also got to walk over penguins too? The zoo enthusiasts out there will agree that everything we've seen so far, we'll see again. Now it's time for something that you really would not expect to see. The long-tailed macaque. You think of primates, you think of rainforests, living in trees, not the ocean. This highly adaptable monkey is spread out on the islands and the mainlands of Southeast Asia. And yes, while they do frequent secondary and lowland rainforests, they also live near rivers, mangrove swamps, along with ocean shorelines, and they use all that water to their advantage. These macaques learn to be excellent swimmers, to escape pythons, raptors, big cats, and even feral dogs. Although fruits, seeds, and apparently whatever they can find in trash cans makes up 90% of their diet, somewhere along the way, they learn to dive to the river or sea floor. And in doing so, they can hold their breath for up to 30 seconds, looking for fish and crustaceans. 
hence their other name, the crab eating macaque. Since they have such a large pool here with an underwater view, there's a chance that you could see that, but I've yet to hear of any kind of monkey pool party taking place. The habitat was built in the late 80s for polar bears, but in 2018, it was converted into a playhouse for the only long-tailed macaques in an AZA accredited zoo. And off the top of my head, I can't think of a better example of a zoo turning a less than adequate habitat into something incredible without changing much to it. This updated project is now called Sharing One World, and it's not just some random name. This monkey lives side by side with people in urban areas. So these monkeys are ambassadors to their wild counterparts to encourage Indiana residents to respect the wildlife that lives around them, just as the people of Southeast Asia are learning to do with the long-tailed macaque. So far, we've seen life from every one of the world's major oceans, except one from the Northern Seas, the Pacific Walrus. One of the world's largest walruses ever recorded was 3,700 pounds, so they're very fat, and for very good reason. Their blubber, which can be 6 inches thick, can make it difficult for a polar bear's claws and sharp teeth to penetrate. It also stores energy, keeps the walrus warm, obviously, and believe it or not, it increases their buoyancy when they swim. The walrus will spend about two-thirds of their lives in water, and they may be buoyant, but that doesn't stop them from making dives. Sometimes they're in a mood for bottom dwellers. They're not picky, but they are determined eaters. Some individuals have been recorded diving over 300 feet below the surface for a meal. This mustachioed pinniped has been an honorary Hoosier since the zoo opened. There's usually always two on display. As of 2021, you can say hello to Ginger, a female born at SeaWorld Orlando. The larger of the two is Aku, a male rescued as an orphan in Alaska. He was found by gold miners on the deck of a barge, hence his name, which means the stern of a boat. If you ever run into a walrus, consider yourself lucky. Indianapolis is only one of three places in America with a walrus and it will be a long time before we ever see one again on our tours. Now it's time to head to this episode's grand finale. This building opened with the zoo in 88, but in 2005, they added the world's first underwater dolphin dome. I've taken you under the surface dozens of times in many, many different ways, but this gives a whole new meaning to the term underwater view. The top of the dome sits 5 feet below the water, and the structure is suspended 10 feet from the bottom of the pool where the cetaceans can swim under. The visitor portion is 12 feet high at the center and is 30 feet in diameter. It was added not only to give guests a brand new experience, but you can stay down here and get a unique perspective of their dolphin presentation. You won't be able to read very many facts about dolphins from down here, which is why it's best to go back above the surface and hear the facts from the trainers themselves. The Dolphin Pavilion features stadium-style seating, facing three backstage pools, connected to a 134-foot-long performance tank, totaling 2.3 million gallons, making it America's second largest indoor dolphin arena. And yeah, the show has the fun music, the acrobatics, and other tricks, but I've been going to the zoo annually for the last decade, and this show has progressively gotten more and more educational every year. Not only do you get to learn about dolphins, but you get to learn about their dolphins. Every presentation brings one member of the pod front and center so you can learn about their personalities and their individual life story. Unlike every other dolphin show out there, or any animal show in general, I'd argue this is not actually about the animals you see in front of you. At some point, the video board gives the audience a break from the jumps and flips and educates you on how your everyday routine can impact wildlife locally and globally, especially Indiana farmers, because even their decisions can actually affect the lives of dolphins out in the wild. And yes, one day we will see the entire show on this channel. According to one of the sources I found, the zoo has 12 Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. And beyond the show and beyond the dome, 
there are other ways that you can get even closer to the Zeus pod to grow your inspiration and connection to the sea if you click on that card in the right hand corner. And that concludes the Indianapolis Zoo's Oceans Exhibit, arguably their prime attraction. And even though it's not said enough, this is one of the greatest zoo aquariums in America. Let me know your thoughts below. And also let me know if this video made you want to head on over to the Indianapolis Zoo on your next zoo trip. And as always, thank you for watching.